Uh, so ma'am, I read a couple of your uh, writings and you've uh, written considerably on the discrimination versus de uh, deprivation aspect of affirmative action. So while I understand that the element of uh, discrimination in reservations is required to truly constitute a representative society, is the idea of depri deprivation with respect to affirmative action something that shouldn't be looked at at all? Uh, <clears throat> well, obviously, uh, affirmative action law mm -hmm. is based on evidence of deprivation, of yeah. discrimination, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of simple, simple statistics which show that the population in an institution is not representative in mm -hmm. any way of the population outside it, right? So it's a... So uh, deprivation certainly comes into the question. Mm -hmm. but deprivation is something you measure along some kind of absolute axis. Mm -hmm. You have or you don't have or you have this much or you don't have mm -hmm. this much and so on, all right? So that is some kind of value. But once students enter... Uh, oh, all right, then the next question you ask is, why this deprivation? Mm -hmm. And that's when you, 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 you often, not always, often hit the, uh, the wall of discrimination. Mm -hmm. okay? That you can, you can think about students as, for some reason, not arriving at the university because mm -hmm. uh, they live too far away, mm -hmm. or uh, they have not had enough um, uh, nutrition to be able to survive, or the schooling was not efficient enough. Now, all these are also indices of discrimination. Hmm. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before they, they, so how you read them yeah, yeah. is a question. So then the next question is why, okay, why is it that given the, the totally skewed representation of castes in the university. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. Now the traditional uh, explanation is these people are equipped and they have merit and that's why they've come in and mm -hmm. a lot of people still believe it. They that still believe the that they are in the university yeah. because they're smart. Things like entrance examinations huh. and so on. Definitely. And, and unless you have uh, student organizations or teachers who tell you otherwise, most people will leave the university thinking that their people yeah. will there, they're smart. And that other people will actually mess up. Uh, you know, imagine having a doctor operate on you who came into the university through reservations. Huh. We see this kind very, of very thing. common argument. Yeah. Very common argument. All right. So one of the things I've constantly tried to emphasize is that um, universities have been now have institutionalized discrimination. Mm -hmm. That gradually, historically, mm -hmm. because it has happened gradually, we're all part of it and we don't even see it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's so much part of every structure in the university. Mm -hmm. That the universities have firm themselves up mm -hmm. as institutions that exclude, huh. structurally exclude. Huh. So think of some of the ways in which this happens. The idea of merit. Yeah. All right. Um, the, the faculty in the university, uh, the language of instruction, uh, the location of the university, mm -hmm. the practices within the university, mm -hmm. the very culture of the university, nature of the disciplines. Okay. You could name a whole series of things like this and you know, each one can be analyzed separately and doesn't even need separate analysis because a lot has been written about all the things. Right? So, yeah, yeah. And then we have gradually, historically consolidated these institutions to exclude. I mean mm -hmm. that is, that would be my observation and my experience and so on. So that exclusion has become something naturalized. Huh. It's taken for granted. And then all to, to add insult to injury, we let a few people in as though it is a great, huh. uh, if, you know. Something we're giving them. Yes, something that is being provided for them, though they don't 
don't quite deserve it <laughs> and they're here only because they have this political clout and we, we, after all we are a democratic country and after all we must uh, acknowledge this kind of thing but secretly we believe that we don't really need to do anything about them. <laughs> okay, so people who come in are battling enormous structural odds apart from attitudes teachers who, I mean, one of the things I'm going to speak about is that we have had a, affirmative action or reservations. I like the word reservations uh -huh. more for, for various reasons. But we have spent no time retooling the university, re-educating the faculty, re-educating yeah. the students, doing research about what, uh -huh. uh, how to reach out to them, how to actually how integrate. To how to transform the university. How to transform. Yeah, so no, I understand. Yeah, it's the problem in the world, I like, definitely. Very yeah. different problematic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's the way we work with it. We say integrate and mainstream, and that's how basically it is. Yes, and in the mainstream, it's assumed what the mainstream should be. Yeah. Now that the mainstream is so utterly irrelevant, mm -hmm. that we're not able to provide one sensible solution to an actual problem mm -hmm. that exists on the ground. I mean, look at all our. Uh, sessions that I have all said the knowledge structure that is come is inadequate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not relevant. That you need to be able to rethink the kind of research that you're doing and so on, right? So there you are. Why is it irrelevant? It's, it's man by the wrong people. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so um, uh, with respect to you talked about uh, the fact that we need to transform the way, say, right now the university is being looked at. So, the way I look at it right now, especially with the Right to Education Act, etc., there is a major thrust on quantitative uh, ways of uh, bringing those people in. How, apart from basic awareness, is there any other way that qualitative change in the scenario can happen? Is there something that is actually happening on ground right now, wherein we're trying to qualitatively bring about a truly representative society and not just a quantitative understanding of it. Well, you know, there are student movements. Mm -hmm. They're very, very important in all this. But institutions are being quite hostile to student movements. Huh. People will keep saying that. All right. And uh, it's also true that often um, uh, students who come in through through reservations are seen as unruly. Huh. For Obvious reasons. I mean, if you if you just put your mind to it, you will mm -hmm. understand why they are regarded. They're already breaking in where they are not supposed to be, mm -hmm. according to the unwritten rules of this institution. Okay. Now, people who break in are, by definition, <laughs> they're already discomforting the yeah. other. Yeah, and uh, they're not entitled. They huh. Are, and so on. So, curricula has not been restructured, institutional rules have not been rethought, um, faculty has not been re educated, um, there have been no serious attempts mm -hmm. to actually address the issue. And in fact, there will be some warm hearted faculty who want to give special classes to these people mm -hmm. who are already finding it hard enough to with huh. the regular classes because they are so uh, uh, unmatched huh, huh. to the requirements uh, that these students have. And then from 5 o'clock when the university gives over to 7 o'clock, some kind of soul wants to talk to them even more. Mm -hmm. Does it help? <coughs> yeah. Okay. So then taking it to the more formal framework side because judicially and the legislatively that is what is that that is what we see formally. Judicially did the concept of reservation ever evolve where there was more an acceptance there, there was more the attempt to create that society where everybody is being seen that way. Or right from the nineteen fifties was there always that um, aspect of is something that the upper caste has to grapple with and there's something that you'd written the upper caste has to grapple with. So like wait, let's give them these many reservations. No, constitutionally it's a very important move. Huh. All right. In fact, uh, we have reservations uh, is 
is the first time, as far as I know, anywhere in the world where what is later called affirmative action in, in America and then now is called affirmative action everywhere. Yeah. So revelations has got much more teeth. <laughs> so you have to do it. <laughs> you require that, that a certain percentage must come. Okay? <laughs> Affirmative action, you just have to show that you are open, that you have, mm -hmm. what, and there is no uh, justicability there. You Ch general umbrella. Yeah. And you, you can't be, it can't be held against you. It's, you have to show certain statistic, you have to show certain effort, mm -hmm. but you can't say you have not admitted 30% or 20% mm -hmm. or whatever. Here, it is legal, it's a, mm -hmm. you have to, it's a, it's a much more strong legislation. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the judiciary is like the university. Hmm. We're, we're, our, our brothers and sisters huh. are in the judiciary. You know, yeah. so we, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, their attitudes and their uh, responses are more or less the same. And when students protest, the judiciary has been, uh, I think, the training that the judiciary has in recognizing rights comes in uh, is a positive factor, but the judiciary is also trained to protect institutions. Hmm. You, uh, uh -huh. And so there's a lot of discussion, uh, analysis, writing that needs to be done by people like you and your colleagues about what does it mean to protect an institution when an institution is being exclusive. Oh, uh, yeah. Indeed. So, um, I just lost. Um, so, what we're basically talking about is that till now on the ground there is nothing that has actually happened at all so we talked about yeah i got it right so uh, when we in fact you keep mentioning this dis distinction between affirmative action and reservation i went through your reading and i think i just intellectually i was not high enough for that um the primary understanding i could get between the affirmative action in us versus reservations in india difference was that for us the social contract was sort of built on creating that society, whether actually that happened or not, is different. Mm -hmm. And for US, that, that concept was something that, okay, in the end, huh, let's just include these people also. But on the ground, as it is happening in India, is it is what is happening in India basically the same as what is happening in the US? That we're, as an afterthought, maybe just being like, okay, yeah, let's include it. Which is I, something I would want to tie to some of the readings I did where initially when the aspect of affirmative action or reservations came in, uh, the judiciary was not that willing to actually give that percentage also. So why, why did that happen? If it was a part of a social contract, why, why was the judiciary so reluctant against it? Well, it's a social contract, but it's a social contract that was forced on the upper castes by the non-upper castes. No? So there are, there's, in a democracy, there's always a play, also a play of numbers. Huh. And uh, there, is, uh, there is an ethical question that mm -hmm. you, you have to face if you are a judge. Mm -hmm. You cannot totally avoid it. So there's an ethical question you have to face, but there's everything about the rest of your cultural mm -hmm. upbringing and your formation that is uh, pushing you against it. Huh. So there's a struggle for the judiciary as well, I would say. You know, they, they also would see someone who has come in on reservations as not capable. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the, the, the whole drama we witnessed over the last two years in the judiciary itself. Huh. Uh, with uh, the tension between judges and yeah. also people who look as though they are driven to the verge of insanity through their experiences. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah would be obvious I mean, you're saying this is the same in America. There's a very different um, uh, demo demographic profile in America and in India. In America, the, uh, the blacks uh, or the African Americans form less than 10% of the population. It's a majority minority as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
here the upper caste form less than 20% of the population. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different picture we're looking at, mm -hmm. right? So their attempts at inclusion, I think where they have been more successful than us is partly because it's a smaller number mm -hmm. and uh, partly because they ha there has been more culture e cultural efforts at inclusion, mm -hmm. right? Whereas which we haven't done here. Mm -hmm. uh, we re it has remained administrative and political. Mm -hmm. uh, those are very, very important. Culture in itself is not enough, but the, the cultural questions are very important. Uh, Especially because we're such a heterogeneous issue. Yeah. Um, there was a point in your writing, uh, somewhere around the 2000, after the M. Nagaraj case, where you said something along the lines of how the parliament is maybe being more inclusive, not, not your two words obviously, but is looking at this aspect in a broader way than the judiciary is. And then we have the Right to Education Act. So is, that, is, is there some connection? Did that flow through? Do we see that in the Right to Education Act that flowed through? Uh, well, the right to education act, I haven't, that's... Uh, or any other thing, I am concerned more with school education. And uh, it had, there's some problems associated with it that I'm aware huh. of, but I'm not really up to date on huh. it. But yes, the parliament will always be more democratic than the judiciary. You, you know, it is an elected body. It represents the people. The judiciary represents rights. Huh. Right? Now, rights are already ideologically loaded. Huh. We as women, you and me, huh. know that we were not entitled to rights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that it took many years yeah. of struggle to say we're equal, we're, we have equal rights. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, well intentioned judges, mm -hmm. uh, good people. Uh, efficient mm -hmm. uh, professionals all right, would still say, but you're a woman, yeah. or yeah. Yeah. whatever it is. Yes, yeah. that, that, that mindset which... It's, uh, it's a, 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 the whole semiology of a culture. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, definitely. And of which the judge is part. The, the great thing about parliament, for, and which is one reason why us refined upper castes have, uh, have such a poor opinion of parliament, mm -hmm. you know. It's, uh, though, and we will always have a great opinion of the judges, it's like, uh, apart from all their uh, uh, finery <laughs> and entourage <laughs> and uh, sessions and so on, by which they maintain this uh, that aura of superiority. Yeah. So if a politician goes with the entourage of 20 cars, we think he's so crass, why does he have to do this? Uh -huh. But if a judge comes with his profession and his government, <laughs> this is the symbol of justice or whatever it is. High pedestal. Yeah. So there's a lot of ceremonial uh, endorsement of mm -hmm. this and uh, whatever it is. So it, it is a democratic institution and it, it bring, it's through that institution that new issues come into the control. Um, any other inputs of what you expect in the coming panel tomorrow about any of these aspects? No, I have no idea. I think that things like the right to education has been very important. But um, uh, I really want to do, uh, for the other thing I want to say about that is that not enough research is being done on any of these things. I don't think Nasser is doing enough research on law and reservations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's enough ethnological research mm -hmm. that is fine-tuned studies of students who have been through this. And, uh, uh, there is some stuff coming out of literary work, novels mm -hmm. and autobiographies mm -hmm. and so on. But uh, there's sociological studies, very few. Um, anthropological and ethnological studies, very few. Mm -hmm. In the US, there was one study that I followed at one point which showed that the social contribution of people who had come into the university through affirmative action mm -hmm. was three or four times as much as those who had not come in through affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Because of that connect? 
it's because of the connect, it's because of who they represent, it's because of where they go back to, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what work they do, mm -hmm. uh, and who they serve. No, who they serve, who they do. And it's very true, even if I think of my own students, I know and this I could be very mean about this. That I know that the students who come in under education and so on are not going to be very different from the other students. But the other students will chase off to America or wherever it is, and I will soon get a picture of them standing next with their wives and their car and their children and their dogs and their refrigerators. <laughs> and uh, that's not the picture I get from my students who come in through reservations. They're still battling many things on the ground. And some of them are also have good jobs. They would also like a refrigerator. Oh. It's not that, but that's not where their self-image lies. You won't find a photograph. Uh, can you see the difference? Yeah, no, I can. And I can relate to it at this point. That's why it just like hits me over. Wow, great. So uh, that's, that's uh, it for the wrap. But yeah.